Hi, and welcome to chapter 18. This is all about conservation biology and biodiversity, and this is Dr. Randy Papke, uh, your teacher for this semester, as I have been all semester. This is the last lecture that I'll be giving this semester. Well, let's go ahead and get started with it. Um, so the first thing is, basically, we need to to know about biodiversity. And biodiversity is defined as literally bio, living things, diversity, you know, how different they are. Uh, so here we're talking about all the different kinds of plants and animals, different species of microbes and, um, and you know, fungi, everything that can exist, every living thing that can exist on the planet. So a lot of people think that biodiversity in itself just innately has importance, but maybe that's not you and maybe you need a little convincing. I'll, I'll start out with trying to convince you a little bit now and hopefully um, throughout this lecture I'll convince you pretty strongly that it's really important for us to have a lot of biodiversity. It is in our own best interest to have this because, first of all, biodiversity has value. Um, the first example that I'm going to step you through is thinking about uh, uh, cancer treatment drugs, chemotherapy drugs. Um, one of the most effective chemotherapy drugs is called Taxol. And Taxol, right over here, you can kind of see the word Taxol. And Taxol, it comes from a plant, specifically it comes from the tree called the Pacific Yew. And this this drug is really effective in treating ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. So if you know anybody with either of those cancers, they might have been treated with Taxol. It's pretty common these days. Um, so, so that's, you know, cancer. Um, there's, you know, things that live in our, our ecosystems that are microbes. And we'll talk a little bit more later about about how those microbes can and do help us all the time. Uh, some other things to consider when you're thinking about plants are like there is this plant called the Madagascar periwinkle and it's in effective in, t in treating leukemia and <clears throat> Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, there, because of, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the Madagascar periwinkle um, we actually know that leukemia and Hodgkin's lymphoma are both highly curable now. My grandmother died from leukemia. This is before we, she had those treatments um, existed. There's um, there's a pit viper, this Malayan pit viper snake, and it, um, the blood of this pit viper actually dissolves blood clots, and this is really helpful in treating some heart attacks and stroke patients. Um, let's see, there's there's a poisonous frog that um, that the saliva of this poisonous frog is actually extremely effective in treating pain. So, so we think, you know, maybe you think about these things as being toxins, but sometimes toxins can help uh, people um, survive. So very, very important, um, very important in, in understanding biodiversity. So those are some things that you might benefit from, but biodiversity also has an intrinsic value. And all that intrinsic value means is that it doesn't matter about a value to humans. You know, we, we should value it anyway, because there are other living things sharing this planet. Um, and, and it's a good thing that they're sharing the planet with us. Um, but that's, you know, just kind of focusing on ourselves is, is a very narrow view of, of, about biodiversity but you know we are humans and we are for most part very utilitarian and so we do think about the services that um, the plants and animals and everything around us uh, provide for us so we can talk about different kinds of services the first one is called provisioning services and that simply means that there's useful products uh, that you can obtain from nature, like food and spices, uh, minerals, um, some kind of, you know, fresh water, medicines, things along those lines. Uh, so those are provisioning services. The next one is regulating services. And these are any services that the ecosystem provides that helps regulate the environment, keeps it stable, like air, water, soil, like all of these things that are um, important for us to stay alive. Uh, 
the fact that plants absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and help regulate our temperatures, the fact that that bees pollinate plants uh, allows us to to um, have food, right? Because they they the pollination is necessary for fruit to grow, for example. Um, and of course, biological control. There's there's a lot of things in nature that keep pests from taking over or keep diseases from taking over. So those are all under the regulating services. The next one that we're going to talk about is habitat services. And habitat services, um, the habitats provide location for lots of species. Um, and they also help provide, um, maintain genetic diversity of the species that live there. So since we, I hope I've already started to convince you that biodiversity is important, having various kinds of habitats for these species to live in is going to be essential. And the last one is cultural services. I know you don't think about this a lot, but nature provides a huge amount of, of cultural services. Like we think about, um, some of the symbols of of companies and uh, and they're they're usually animals. I mean, a lot of them. So aesthetics and inspiration. We can think about um, recreation and mental health. If you've ever heard of like Japanese uh, forest bathing, right, to calm you down and help with your anxiety. Uh, also tourism. Well, lots of people can make money off of. Uh, having a really cool cultural or natural place and bringing in tourism that's a cultural service and of course uh, spiritual a lot of people see spirituality in nature and um, and so that is a service that we like to talk about so uh, I, I do like the section in your book this this chapter this is how we do it I don't know if you've been reading that or not but uh, there's a big oil spill in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. You might have heard about it. It was a pretty huge deal. So there, this oil rig was drilling about a mile under the surface of the water and it literally exploded. It had this huge massive leak. It took about three months to actually cap the well. And during that whole time, more than 200 million gallons of oil spilled. I don't know if you can get your mind around how much 200 million gallons of oil is, but it's, it's immense. It's massive. At the same time, about 200,000 tons of methane gas was released. And as we're going to learn, methane gas is, is a big deal when it comes to global climate change. So it, methane gas can dissolve in the water though. And that's what we're going to focus on at this point. The, the, the oil and gas that spilled caused heavy damage to the coasts and to the marine environment. And we still don't know all the effects that uh, um, will be had and are, they're experiencing right now due to this um, oil spill. So interestingly though, about 200,000 gallons of methane gas, it actually, I said gallons, but tons of methane gas, it actually disappeared. And um, so researchers spent a lot of time trying to find that methane uh, gas that spilled into the the ocean that dissolved into the ocean. So they built these three D maps of the affected region, and they put uh, two hundred and seven different locations. They placed sensors underneath the water, and these sensors were there to collect samples um, to test for the presence of methane. So they're they're looking for methane just to monitor it. But what what they found really, really surprised them. <clears throat> and that is that these sensors, after a couple of months, were finding less and less methane until finally they found that that methane had all disappeared. And so uh, they were wondering, did the oil and methane just kind of drift away? Or was that oil and methane used as food for bacteria that live in the ocean? So, this is our testable prediction and look at look at um, this if statement if bacteria were consuming the methane and the then part then there should be a chemical trace of their activity so we've got the if part is the hypothesis and the then parts the prediction there's our testable prediction
Okay, so what would they look for as a chemical trace of this activity? And one of the things that we know about bacteria is that they, just like you, consume oxygen when they are eating. And so in this case, if they're eating methane, then they also need to bring in oxygen out of that water to, in order to break down that methane. And so they te tested these samples, these water samples, for oxygen concentration. Remember that they knew that the methane levels were going down, but if the methane had just kind of dispersed throughout the ocean, then there would be the same amount of oxygen, that oxygen concentration would stay the same. In the spill zone, though, however, the oxygen concentration dropped from 67% to 59%. And that means that the bacteria were actually consuming, eating, mopping up, if you will, the oil and uh, methane. <clears throat> so, so the next question in science, because there's always another question, right, is could the scientists determine which, which of the millions and millions of bacterial species, which ones were responsible? And so they did this DNA sequencing, and, uh, and they looked specifically at microbes that are known to be methane-eating microbes. So they're looking for those specifically. And, um, and the ones that they're, they found that were in abundance in the Gulf of Mexico were related to other methane-eating microbes that they were familiar with. And they did this, and they figured this out based on DNA sequencing. Um, then they took the... the um, the bacteria and they looked at the presence of the bacteria um, and they were wondering like it, are all of these bacteria here just kind of because there's already lots of natural oil seeping into the water from the ground is that why it was so quick to happen and that's that's what they concluded too is that, that they're they are already living there because there's a little, a little bit of natural oil seepage and when we had this huge oil spill, they were able to at least break down the methane part of it. There's still a lot of oil around, but there's no evidence of these types of microbes without this kind of natural oil seepage. For example, when we have oil spills in Arctic regions where there's not this natural oil seepage issue, the, the same kind of response couldn't possibly happen because there are not already living there. So, um, so biodiversity and how, uh, how microbes actually help us in our, well, in our failures, in this case, the failure of um, an explosion of an oil uh, well. All right, so that's a very practical application. Uh, we're going to look at all different kinds of things, things about biodiversity, including the different levels at which biodiversity happens. So, um, so whatever habitat has greater biodiversity, one with three or four species of birds or reptiles, mammals, plants, um, how does that compare with one that has like lots of a specific species of individual fruit flies, right? Or one that has a hundred totally different species of like prokaryotes. These are just different ways that we might think about biodiversity occurring at different levels. So the, the three main levels that I want you to know about are the ecosystem level. That's the number of ecosystems that our specific region has. So if you look at, if you look at, you know, this map here in North America, we actually have lots of different ecosystems all across the the eastern coast of North America, especially specifically the United States. In a specific ecosystem, though, you might actually count up the number of species that are found in that ecosystem. So the number of ecosystems is one measure of biodiversity, but the number of species is another measurement of biodiversity, the number of species within a specific ecosystem. If you look at a specific species within that ecosystem, like this frog right here, you might look at the biodiversity of their genetic diversity. So how many different alleles are there present in as any specific species? All of this information is going to be very, very helpful in figuring out things that we want to know about addressing biodiversity and how like we want, might want to prioritize different aspects of biodiversity and so forth. So um, 
So if we do want to prioritize biodiversity, which I think is an important thing, then now comes into the our, our lexicon, our language, the term conservation biology. And conservation biology addresses how we understand and preserve the biological resources that we have at all levels. Remember, we've got ecosystem, we've got species, and we've got genetic diversity. So conservation biology is going to, to address all of those. And of course, it's going to be very, very complex and there's lots of decisions that have to be made once we realize that there might be some problems with biodiversity, which there totally is. And so we're going to like, sp we're going to spend a big chunk of this chapter kind of exploring how humans have affected nature and and what because we have done so much to affect nature, like off-road vehicles and snowmobiles and just from this picture. But you can think of a thousand different ways that humans have affected nature. Well, that makes us all so responsible for figuring out how to fix it, since we're the cause. Um, if we look around the globe, biodiversity happens for the most part. If you look on land versus just in the water, on land, the most biodiversity that exists is around the equator. And as you go north and south of the equator, that biodiversity drops off. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of biodiversity, for example, in North America. Um, this is the number of mammalian species alone at in the middle of North America. And we've got, you know, we've got somewhere in the nature of 200, 220 different mammalian species just in our region alone. Um, if you look at the oceans, we, we see a very similar pattern of where the oceans, where it's warm um, we, and lots of sunlight. We have a lot of different species of, in this example, it's copepods, which are a really cool little um, crustacean looking thing. Uh, but as you go north, as you get into the cooler waters, there is less and less marine biodiversity. Um, what causes all of these differences? I, I gave you a few hints. Um, the differences, and, and we've got a new term here, which is species richness. Um, species richness is simply defined as the number of species in an area. Uh, you think about it, richness in the way you think about money, you know, how much money does one person have? Species richness is how much species are there in one particular area. So there are a few big factors that are going to affect this, including how much solar energy is available. That's the one I was hinting at from before. The more solar energy there is, the more fuel for life. Think about um, think about the food chains that we talked about in previous chapters, uh, right? Lots of solar energy means lots of primary producers. Um, other things, though, that can influence it is the evolutionary history of an area. For example, um, as time goes by, communities tend to become uh, more diverse, and that's because evolution is happening. So um, the more stable an ecosystem is without a big climactic event like Ice Age or humans kind of getting in there, um, the more species that are going to be found. The last one here, here is the rate of disturbance. Um, how much disturbance is going on? We see this forest fire, right? And you think, this is a little counterintuitive, but you would think that if there was very little disturbance, then then you'd have more species. But it turns out that like disturbance with forest fires or, or things like big things like tsunamis, those events, if they happen a medium amount of time actually can have a huge effect on on um, but biodiversity so volcanic eruptions and floods actually may keep communities from kind of getting to be so stable that they dec they have decreased diversity intermediate amount of environmental disturbance not so high that all the species are wiped out not so low that maybe the ones with a competitive advantage drive off the less competitive species. That's going to have the most species diversity or richness. Um, let's, if you look around the world, there are these places called hotspots, and there are 25 biodiversity hotspots around the world. These hotspots cover less than 1% of the world's area, 
that's including um, oceans, but they have 20% or more of the world's species. So if you look here, a lot of them are uh, rainforests. You do see a lot of biodiversity hotspots at the equator. Um, you also see a lot of them on islands. And we've got, um, we've got the forests, the rainforests of, of uh, South America, as well as the rainforests of Central America. Um, there's just there's actually surprisingly a lot of biodiversity around the Mediterranean Sea and um, also in in Indo Burma and the uh, mountains of southwestern China. So so places that might be really important if we're trying to maintain biodiversity. Um, of course, one of the things that's been happening is that uh, biodiversity has been decreasing over time. And there's lots of causes for this thing called extinction where biodiversity is in decreasing because species go extinct. Um, if we look at it just on average, we can see that uh, that we've been able to measure that about, you know, a species can live around for about 10 million years before it goes extinct. Um, the one that we're going to look at right now is is the um, passenger pigeon. Just just really briefly, this picture that you see here is is of Martha, the very last passenger pigeon that lived in the Cincinnati Zoo, like back in the 1900s. And but before before that, before Martha was the last of her kind, um, passenger pigeons used to um, come in flocks of millions, and they would like cover the sky with how many pigeons there were but and you know there was an, a big hunting you know there's like lots of good food and on a pigeon and so people went and they hunted pigeons and they hunted them so much that they could actually kill 50,000 birds in a single hunting expedition in a single day so um, that's kind of what did in the passenger pigeon, and it's not always hunting that does in our uh, our organisms on this planet, but that is something that definitely does occur. If we think about extinctions, <clears throat> I want you to think about it in two different ways. Um, there's something called mass extinction, and then there's something called background extinction. And on this graph here, if you, if you can see the the light green color is the background extinction, and then those peaks, those spikes, those are mass extinctions. So um, if you look over time, there's one, two, three, four, five mass extinctions that have happened, uh, and those are when a large number of species, even even like entire families, remember Deer King Philip came up. Uh, uh, over four good spaghetti, right? So families is is the the four. So it's the level level just above genus. Um, so they become extinct, and it happens over a very very short period of time, and it's usually due to some extraordinary and sudden environmental change. Uh, for example, this spike right here. If I can get my mouse to cooperate, this spike right here. That's the spike of when the dinosaurs went extinct. So there's always background extinctions going on, but, um, but mass extinctions, again, very, very short period of time, lots and lots of organisms going extinct. So um, what can happen that, what things can happen that influence background extinction? Because mass extinctions are interesting and fun to look at and you know fascinating but background extinctions are happening all the time so here's a few things that will help you understand why background extinctions happen the first thing is geographic range so if a species is restricted to a very small region we say that's restricted range compared to if a geographic region is extensive uh, very very much covering a lot of land, then the one that is experiencing the more restricted location is got a higher chance of going extinct than the one that has a range that covers more land. The next is local population size. Um, if you've got a species with a small population size, of course it's much more likely to go extinct than 
um, if you have a large population size. And, and it can go extinct for any number of reasons. It could be due to um, you know, a local fire, or it could be due to some disease. It could be due to habitat destruction. It could also be due to predation. So there's lots of reasons, but of course it makes sense that small population sizes are, have a higher chance of going extinct than large population sizes. The next one is habitat tolerance, and this is the third of our three major causes for background extinctions. Um, habitat tolerance are how many different um, places a specific species can live. So if you look here, we've got uh, a bird with narrow habitat tolerance. It can only live on this one little location as opposed to this other species here that has a broad habitat tolerance. It can do fine on the ground, in the tree, on a branch, right? So different different tolerances um, within the habitat. Uh, if they have narrow, they're more likely to go extinct. So unfortunately, right now, right, that's that's all background extinction, and there's not too much humans are playing a role in that, but we are actually right now in the midst of a big mass extinction. And just some data for you here, like more than 10% of all mammals on the planet are endangered and 21% are endangered or threatened. So the difference between endangered and threatened are is that endangered is that they have um, like an imminent chance of going extinct and threatened means that they they've got a little bit less of a chance but there's there's definitely some problems going on. 4% um, of all bird species are endangered. 13% um, are either endangered or threatened and 50% are in decline. Just think about that for a second. 50% of all birds are in decline. They're decreasing in their population size. And remember what happens when population size gets too small, right? They've got, they've got a higher chance of, of going extinct. One third of all amphibian species are either endangered or threatened. Um, and that number is actually growing larger and larger. This, ever since your book has been published, that the, the number is actually much higher than we thought before. So um, there, there are lots of other organisms that are going through these same kind of worries. We see, uh, we see fish, we see mollusks and insects and fungi and plants. All of these are decreasing. And, and you might be saying to yourself, well, who cares about the insects or who cares about the fungi, right? They don't seem to be any big deal to you. But again, remember that we like biodiversity because if we're only going to be selfish about it, that they can provide these services to us, like the drug Texol um, or the other ones that I have mentioned to you. So, so, um, yeah, we're in the middle of a huge mass extinction, and we are the cause of it, which sucks. Uh, we are absolutely the cause of it. And there's the main reason for this, for these extinctions that are happening, um, these mass extinctions, again, this is not a background extinction, is habitat loss and degradation. And of course, habitat loss and the degradation of the habitats are caused by cities, urban development, and agriculture. So it doesn't matter where you go, if you've got agriculture, if you've got cities, or, I mean, and, and urban development isn't just about cities. It's about, it's about suburbs, right? It's about towns. It's about any time where we take over a habitat and change it to fit us. And I am not saying that we shouldn't have cities or we shouldn't be living um, in comfortable situations, but it's, there are effects of what we do to this world. And of course we have to have agriculture, but does it have to be in a tropical rainforest, which has got the highest level of biodiversity um, on land and on the planet? So if we start measuring um, loss of, of forests about, um, half of the world's tropical rainforests have been lost in the past 25 years. And it's really hard to blame the peoples who live in these areas. You know, they need food too. Um, they, they have the right to build cities too, but we are losing these, these valuable resources and, and we're losing biodiversity. So when, when we, 
focus on not just the um, the tropical rainforest, but we think about in our own backyard, um, the Pacific Northwest is is having trees removed at an unsustainable rate, and um, this is in our own backyard, and we don't even think about it. But of course, remember that the Pacific Northwest is the location where the Pacific U is found, and the Pacific U is what makes taxol. So we're kind of destroying ourselves by by having these unsustainable practices. Of course, we also are um, in Africa, for example, where we're exploiting the resources out there and we're driving animals close to extinction. The bonobo is the animal relative that's closest to humans, and they are extremely close to extinction. In the case of the bonobos, um, they're being they're going extinct mostly because they're being used for food. <clears throat> I mean, this is our closest relative and, and we're, we're eating this relative. So just kind of something to think about. Um, I'll take up the idea of how ecosystem disturbances can be reversed in our next, uh, in our next video. So stand by.